So Columbus was born to a middle-class Italian merchant family in the northern Italian port city of Genoa. Now, at this time, it, Italy wasn't, you know, a united country. Uh, it was a collection of feudal city-states, and Columbus was Genoese, uh, and he was proudly a Genoese uh, to the end of his life. Uh, in, in the environment of kind of late medieval northern Italy, he was impacted by profoundly by basically two major influence uh, influences. First of all was Christianity, and the other was the ocean, the sea. Uh, Christopher grew, grew up watching sailing ships coming and going from the busy harbor down below where he lived in Genoa. And the sailors, you know, they'd be coming with these tales of adventure. And, you know, Christopher Columbus, you can just imagine he, he was probably fascinated by all of this. And it was not long until he found himself involved in the sailing trade. Uh, the records suggest that, you know, it may have been as, as early as 10 years old, which, which wasn't uncommon, uh, in, in that era. Uh, these were, they were known as grommets or cabin boys, as we might call them. And they, they did kind of all the little dirty work tasks around the ship, but they basically were being trained up to become sailors later in life. Um, Columbus also appears to have become even more religiously devout, uh, than most people during his time. And, and that's saying something, uh, in the 1400s, uh, re it was a religiously saturated culture that he grew up in. Um, you know, obviously being in, in Italy in the medieval period or the late medieval period, uh, you know, Catholicism was, was the big show in town. And, uh, and, and during his formative years, you know, the big story that was going on in the news, you know, if you turn on CNN in 14, 60, they were talking about the ongoing conflicts between the Christians and the Muslims, which had been going on for centuries at this point. Uh, multiple crusades had been uh, been launched in the preceding centuries. They had failed to retake Jerusalem from the Muslims. And to make matters worse, during Columbus's early childhood, the second largest center of Christianity, Constantinople, fell to the Muslims. I mean, this would be like, I mean, it would be way bigger than 9-11. For him, let's just put it that way. I mean, this was for for Christendom to lose. It was the other capital, or kind of two capitals of the Christian uh, Empire, one being in Rome and the other one being at Constantinople. And to lose one of those to the Muslims was like, it was a big deal. Um, so, you know, in in Columbus's formative years, he's he's watching this epic struggle between Christian civilization and the ascendant Islam, which seems to be kind of squeezing Christendom into you know, a smaller and smaller box. And people like Columbus felt that the Muslims were the great Antichrist mentioned at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation. You know, uh, basically this led him and a lot of people of his time to kind of believe that the end was coming. Uh, he, he got into sort of the apocalyptic fervor of that era, believing that, that you know, the world was uh, was going to end soon due to the the rise of, of Islam, the great... Uh, uh, Antichrist, and there were growing schisms in the church, and, and there were all sorts of issues. So you have to imagine kind of as Columbus is, is in his formative years, in his teens, 20s, he has all these ideas swirling around in his mind. Uh, and, you know, he, he himself actually, interestingly enough, predicted that there were only 150 years left until Jesus was going to come again. And so he had a very strong outlook on uh, kind of world history and this epic religious struggle uh, that was going on and that he had a part in it. And like kind of a typical idealist in his 20s, you know, Columbus began to form his ideas about the world and his role in it. And it was this, you know, confluence of two influences, this religious worldview and his belief in kind of the end of the world and the, the threats to Christianity from the outside um, and his desire to, you know, kind of make Christianity great again, that's kind of one thing. And then he also has this passion for sailing in the sea. And that kind of, those two ingredients are key to keep in mind because they, the, when you understand those in his history, you end up seeing what this vision is that he comes up with so that basically becomes the motivation for all his later actions. And I'm like, I cannot understate the importance of this vision. This was his life work right? His vision was that he could save Christianity and prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ through the use of his navigational skills and finding Asia. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little more detail in a moment, but he basically was like a proto-entrepreneur. He was like sort of almost like an Elon Musk of his time. He believed that his idea could not only revolutionize the world, but that it could save it. 
So what was this great idea? Well, he basically, he grew up reading the tales of Marco Polo's travels and adventures in Asia. And, uh, you know, you can only imagine as a, you know, young sailor, how much those stories absolutely fascinated him. In fact, they even have a copy of Marco Polo's travels where Columbus had written a bunch of notes in the margins all over it. So he was, he was definitely reading this. And it's actually pretty interesting to see that we still have a copy of, or basically his copy of Marco Polo's travels. Now, the stories of Marco Polo told of immense amounts of gold in Asia. And this, this leader there called the Great Khan. And the great Khan uh, had told Marco Polo that he wanted to hear, uh, you know, from Christian missionaries that he he had expressed some interest. And so, you know, there also was at the time of Columbus a lot of discussion amongst navigators about the nature of the Earth's geography. Now, essentially, everyone knew that the world was round. That, like anyone who says otherwise, is just doesn't understand what's going on. They knew it was round, but there were debates about the size of the Earth, how far around it was, and its geography. And Columbus essentially believed the prevailing notion that Asia could not be reached by sailing west due to its vast distance from Europe. He believed that that was incorrect. He sided with, you know, what was likely respectable, uh, but a minority view that the world was actually quite smaller. Um, so with that in mind, he believed that by sailing west, he could find a new trade route to Asia and its riches. Not necessarily so that he himself could personally be enriched, though he wasn't opposed to that. Um, but by finding this Western trade route to Asia, he thought he could be the means of finding new military alliances in the East, w East with these powerful kingdoms like the Great Khan, as well as the wealth and gold necessary to raise an army that would retake the great city of Jerusalem in preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. He basically felt, this was his whole idea, was that he could reverse the decline of Christendom and literally save the world, uh, save the souls of mankind through this journey. And, and so when you have that in mind, you, you really want to remember that is what is on Columbus's mind. It's what's driving him. If you read any of the primary historical sources from him, he's, that's like what he's talking about all the time. His commitment to this vision, uh, you know, makes sense of all the actions in his life. Uh, it also can be seen kind of immediately because he very diligently and very boldly, you know, was just a middle-class merchant, but he tries to sell this big idea to some of the most powerful people on earth. And like a determined entrepreneur with a big idea, he spent almost a decade of his life trying to sell this idea over and over to potential backers uh, whilst he kind of continued his day job as a skilled navigator and was actually pretty good at it and had a good reputation. Uh, however, not everyone shared in Columbus's big vision, uh, either from a nautical perspective or from a religious perspective. And so he faced essentially a lot of rejections, but he didn't give up. Eventually, after years and years of trying, it was Queen Isabella of Spain that finally brought his vision, uh, kind of his vision, uh, that bought into his vision, I'm sorry, and uh, ended up backing the idea. This was likely because Isabella shared Columbus's above average kind of religious fervor. Uh, her husband, King Ferdinand, also supported the voyage, but was probably just for all intents and purposes, it seems though that he was for more of the practical reasons. Um, the primary Spanish rival at that time, the Portuguese, were already making attempts to reach Asia by sea, uh, by going around Africa. And uh, this did present a chance to Ferdinand and, and Isabella that they could, you know, basically help the Spanish win the spice race, you know, this race to get to Asia between them and the Portuguese. So with buy-in from Spain, uh, they formulated a plan. Uh, and despite him not being a Spaniard, which was an issue that, uh, you know, plagued him throughout his, his entire, all of his voyages. You know, Columbus is not a Spaniard. He's Genoese. Uh, but Columbus was to sail west uh, to try and find the great Khan of Asia and to discover new territory that could be incorporated into the Spanish realm. Uh, and, and the idea was that he could, once he found these hopefully islands or something off the coast of, of Asia, they could set up a trading base, kind of the way that the Portuguese had done and others had done in the Canary Islands and other islands off the, the coast of, uh, of Africa. Um, and the idea was that this trading base and the wealth from the new lands discovered would serve to make Spain the richest nation in Europe. 
and that it would give them the funds needed to raise an army that would then lead Christendom back to glory uh, via the reconquest of Jerusalem. Now, this isn't to say that Columbus was totally selfless and didn't want any personal benefit from uh, this endeavor. Like any good entrepreneur, he pushed a hard bargain. He saw this endeavor as a way to continue his rise out of middle-class obscurity and into the respected aristocracy of his time. Uh, he would both receive money in in the uh, in the form of uh, I think it was ten percent of the proceeds that would come out of the the venture. But he also wanted titles, um, and this was his way of in that time. That was kind of the way you secured your your station for your family long term was by having titles that could then be passed on to your heirs. Um, it's very likely that the crown envisioned that, uh, that this was going to be a voyage that would discover a few islands, set up a profitable trading post with missionary operations to the people of Asia. Uh, but neither Columbus nor the king nor the queen had any idea what they were about to stumble on. And as we'll see, much of what ensued later was largely a result of this gross underestimation of of what they thought this was going to be. And a lot of the issues were kind of their attempts to deal with the magnitude and complexity of such a momentous discovery. So let's get into the story of the first voyage. The first step of Columbus getting his voyage off the ground was securing ships and a crew. Unfortunately, Columbus' first voyage was actually not really seen as a top priority for a lot of the Spanish, you know, kind of aristocracy. And uh, they were in the middle of these mass deportation of Jews, which is actually really terrible and sad uh, at that time. And uh, it required a lot of ships. And so there weren't a lot of ships around. So the king and queen called in a debt that was owed to them by the port town of Palos to provide two ships when the need arose. And so probably with some reluctance, uh, two small ships, the Nina and the Pinta, along with two captains, uh, the Pinzon brothers uh, is, is who they were, uh, were chartered for the trip basically to pay this town's debt. Um, the Pinzon brothers brought along with them crews that were already kind of loyal to them. Uh, nobody really knew who Columbus was. Uh, and they ended up getting another larger vessel called the Santa Maria, which actually was kind of large and and cumbersome. Columbus didn't really like it, but it was chartered as the flagship uh, that would take, you know, that he would be on. Uh, and that would be the, you know, three ship exploration fleet that was going to leave and, and go to the new world or basically uh, into the unknown at that time. Uh, so Columbus prepared for uh, his journey with respectable, though not top of the line ships and with a crew that likely were less than enthusiastic uh, about following this, you know, this foreigner with these eccentric ideas into what could be their deaths at sea. Um, and this division between the foreigner Columbus and the men who went with him proved to be a theme that ran throughout all of his journeys. You're going to see this over and over again. So. Columbus, with the three ships under his command, set sail in August of 1492, and they sailed southwest uh, through familiar seas uh, off the, uh, the the northern coast of Africa down towards uh, the Canary Islands, um, and then turned west and began to sail into the unknown. Um, and as they sailed for weeks, Columbus would intentionally uh, at least we believe it was intentionally, he would underestimate their speed and distance. Uh, and he did this in order to help make the men kind of feel they weren't so far from Spain as they crossed horizon after horizon. You can imagine these guys are, you know, they're getting a little freaked out. He's like, oh, you know, we're not that far from Spain, but they were actually even farther than than he was letting on because he wanted to see how far he could get. So by the time they get into the second month, of this voyage. You know, they have been on this boat for a long time and the crew begins to have some serious concerns uh, about where they were and if they were ever going to find land. And people were starting to say, you know, we need to go back. This is crazy. And mutiny was seeming likely. And however, Columbus had seen some signs of land. There was some seaweed and there were some birds and, and he was able to convince the crew to give him three more days. And he prayed hard. And it, almost like in a storybook with the timing, during the pre-dawn of the third day, Columbus was on the deck and he was unable to sleep and he was looking for land. And he thought that he spotted a light in the distance, but he wasn't quite sure. Uh, so he didn't make an official call of land, but he did mention it to some of the people around him. Uh, and 
a little later than that, uh, a little later in the evening, late, late into the night, another sailor called in a loud voice that he saw land when he thought he also saw the light in the darkness. Um, now everyone was on pins and needles because they, you know, they're in the middle of the night and they're in unknown seas. And now they think they might have land in front of them. So they, they slow down. Uh, and basically Columbus says, Hey, let's stop sailing and let's just heave to and drift until dawn comes and we can see if this really is land in front of us. And at dawn, the light began to grow brighter and brighter and they looked out and there was a long green island that was laying in front of them. And you can only imagine what Columbus was feeling on that early morning. All of his many years of pitching his ideas and being rejected and being called crazy and he had this wild theory all of a sudden, it all seems validated. In his mind, he had reached some island off the Asian mainland and all his wildest dreams about saving the world were about to come true. His premonitions that he was on a special mission from God as the Christ bearer to save Christianity must have solidified in his mind upon seeing that island which no one from his world even knew existed. The vindication he must have felt must have been just immense, okay? In fact, it seems that it was so immense that in later voyages, when he should have been convinced that he was not in Asia, he still kind of clung to that idea. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Columbus, nor anyone else, had any idea what had actually just happened. He landed in the Bahamas on a small island that is now called San Salvador, which he, actually he named. Um, and after sailing around it, it wasn't a really big island, it was a fairly small island. So he sailed around it and he found a good landing spot on the far side. And uh, they could see, you know, naked native people standing on the beaches. Uh, they were, you know, curious and just like, what the heck is this? You know, you can only imagine what they were thinking when these bearded men and this big crazy ship with white sails and they have swords and everything else. I and mean, they, they were just like blown away. Um, and neither party realized the significance of what was actually going on. I mean, this was two new civilizations uh, encountering encountering one another. Uh, they were all curious, but they were also cautious. They weren't exactly sure what was going to happen. Uh, so Columbus and his men went to the beach and they, you know, gave a, a prayer to God, thanking them for their safety. And then Columbus followed the, the official state ceremony for claiming land for Spain. And all the natives are looking on and kind of just like, what in the frig are these guys doing? Uh, and um, when the ceremony was over, both sides were curious, but they, they weren't exactly sure what was going to happen. Um, however, Columbus and his, his men, they, they were Europeans and Europeans had been discovering other lands, you know, far off lands kind of for the first time. So they, they were a little more prepared and understood maybe what might be a good first step. And they had brought with them a bunch of little trinkets, right? That one of the really, the one they used a ton were these things called hawks bells, which basically looked like a little jingle bell, uh, that the natives loved. And they brought those along to trade. And so they offered some of these little trinkets to the natives and they were fascinated and pleased and kind of were like, oh, these guys are, these guys are bringing us gifts. Like, cool. And so they bring gifts out to the, to Columbus and his men. And within a short while, both sides kind of realized that they didn't have to fear each other. Everyone's cool. And uh, the crew in Columbus begin trying to interact with the natives and they're trying to communicate and figure out what's going on. There's a lot of miscommunication happening. Um, but, you know, overall, it's kind of like, hey, this is, you know, kind of an interesting Curious, a curious interaction between these two groups. Um, now, Columbus had an eye towards, you know, teaching and converting any of the people that they encountered uh, as they were exploring. And uh, he was immediately impressed by the natives' kindness, their generosity, their innocence. And he wrote back to the Queen of Spain, letting them know that these people would make excellent Christians and vassals. Uh, he felt that they were natural Christians and seemed to share, you know, whatever they had. Uh, they, they were peaceful. And, uh, you know, he also quickly learned from these natives, though, that, that the peaceful ones that they were with weren't the only ones around. And, and they were able to kind of uh, communicate to Columbus that there were other tribes that were, you know, that he needed to be aware of. The, the, the Carib tribes is what they called them. And uh, that they were cannibals and they would kill and take and, and would raid their villages and take their women into sex slavery and eat the babies that were born and all this kind of stuff. And so Columbus and his men, you know, kind of hear about this. So they're kind of like, whoa, like, I guess we do have to be on our guard here. Um, now, Columbus was fascinated with the little island, but he only stayed for a few days. Um, he was on a mission to find the great Khan and the gold described by Marco Polo in order to finance a crusade to save Europe and retake Jerusalem. 
So when Columbus was told about much larger islands and land masses uh, farther to the the south and uh, and west by the natives, he he basically was like, well, we got to keep going. You know, we got to go find the Great Khan. Um, and and he was he really was looking for gold, um, not just because obviously gold is good in and of itself, but it also acted as kind of the 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 smoke that said that they were close to the great Khan of Asia and the great riches of Asia because there was supposed to be a lot of gold there. So if they found gold, that must mean that they were getting closer. Um, anyway, so he also needed to provide a return to the king and queen. Uh, you know, they had just invested a bunch of money in it. And so he was, you know, he kind of had multiple reasons. Obviously his own rich, rich enrichment played a factor, um, obviously paying back the king and queen, but ultimately his view on the gold was that he wanted to use it uh, or that it was a sign that they were near Asia and that it could be used to finance uh, both his his current voyage and, you know, this crusade to Jerusalem. Now, as Columbus sailed on to the next set of islands, he, he was kind of concerned because he didn't speak the language. Uh, he, there might be hostile tribes around or even the peaceful tribes might misinterpret what they're doing as, as hostile. Uh, you know, he doesn't know his way around. He doesn't know where there's reefs, all that kind of stuff. And so when he comes to the next set of islands, he takes some natives by force onto his ship. He actually kind of like kidnaps them, essentially. And uh, he, But what he does is he immediately gives them food clothing, gifts, and basically treats them well and gives them assurance that they'd be returned to their homes if they'd cooperate. Uh, basically, the natives were told that the Spanish needed local guides and someone to help them learn the language. And, uh, you know, some of them kind of jumped ship fairly quickly after they were captured as soon as they got the chance because they didn't really want to, you know, they were interested in this deal. Uh, but others stayed with the ships and actually acted as local diplomats uh, when they came to other tribes in the areas, kind of saying, hey, these guys are coming in peace and, uh, you know, don't don't hassle them. So over the next couple of weeks, Columbus jumps around to a few other small islands trying to figure out exactly where he is and where he should go next. Um, Columbus believed that, uh, you know, he was on a set of islands that were not too far off the coast of mainland Asia, when in reality, he was in a set of islands in the Bahamas, just off the coast of an undiscovered continent, the Americas. Now, Columbus' course took him south and west through the Bahamas to the northern coast of Cuba. And when he saw this, you know, obviously large landmass, he began to think that maybe he had found the Asian mainland or perhaps Japan, uh, which Marco Polo called Sepengu. Um, however, he sailed from bay to bay down the coast of northern Cuba, just, you know, he just kept finding, you know, native tribes. And there were no signs of gold or Asian civilization. And uh, anyway, he started to become kind of concerned about this, right? Um, Columbus he was concerned, but he also was enchanted because these islands were absolutely beautiful. Um, but the Spaniards who were with him also were becoming more and more worried about the lack of gold. They had come on this journey, not necessarily so much because they wanted to find the Great Khan and all this, you know, new crusade to Jerusalem and all that kind of stuff. They they just were there for the gold. And, uh, you know, they had just taken this really risky voyage. They'd been to some of these islands. They were told that there were going to be a ton of gold here. And all of a sudden they're looking around going, I like, what's going on here? Like, I, we're not seeing gold. We're not kind of seeing what we thought we were going to see if we found land. Now, as Columbus was nearing the northern coast of Cuba and, and towards the end of it at the far eastern end, he was shocked. Um, one day he looks out and he sees the Pinta just sailing off in another direction without his permission. Essentially, one of the Pinzon brothers, one of the captains, uh, kind of was fed up with with following Columbus. And he had talked to a native who had told him uh, that there was some gold on another island north of there. Um, and so he decided, well, I'm just going to go on my own and go get the gold myself. Um, so Columbus sits there, he helplessly watches as the Pinta sails out of sight and he is frustrated, but doesn't know what to do. And he just kind of says, all right, well, let's, let's continue sailing on and, and hopefully we'll reunite. Um, so Columbus was in the Santa Marina and the Nina with him. They, they pressed on and eventually got, uh, they crossed over from Cuba to Haiti, to modern Haiti, which they later named Hispaniola, uh, which was the name they all referred to the island where Haiti and the Dominican Republic are now. Now, Columbus was encouraged when he got to, to what is modern day Haiti because they encountered tribes that seemed more advanced. 
and they were told about gold on the island uh, by and and this and this mighty local chief named Guacanagri, and uh, and basically they were told that they should meet with him. He's the big ruler in the area, and so they're kind of like, all right, cool, we found a, a you know a bigger place, better place. So they they kind of sail eastward along the northern coast of Haiti toward where they were told that uh, that Guacanagri was going to be. Um, now at this point. It's like December. Uh, they left in August. So it's been nearly four months by this point. And uh, they'd spent almost two months island hopping around and not really finding much more than beautiful exotic landscapes and small, poor local tribes. Um, but spirits were up at this point because they felt like they were approaching something more significant, this, this more significant tribal kingdom. And there were rumors that there was gold. They, they had heard from the natives that there was gold in that area. So after sailing along the northern coast of Haiti, um, Columbus was pleased to find and have an introduction to Chief Guacanagri um, on the northern coast of Haiti. Um, but this kind of, uh, you know, better luck ran out fairly soon on uh, on Christmas Eve of 1492, to be exact. Uh, on the night of Christmas Eve, it was a very calm night, uh, nearly windless. And uh, the sailor that was in charge of kind of overseeing the ship at nighttime that night uh, was at the helm of Columbus's flagship, uh, the Santa Maria, and he was tired. And so despite Columbus's orders to never do this, the experienced sailor decided to go to sleep and to put a cabin boy, uh, one of the young grommets on board in charge of the wheel of the ship. I can only imagine, we can only imagine how Columbus felt when he heard the ship running aground in the darkness and he jumped from his from his bed realizing that the ship was running into running aground they're thousands of miles from home at this point it was like a sailor's worst nightmare as dawn broke um on christmas morning of 1492 columbus found himself with only his smallest ship the nina left to get him and his men home he was distraught um luckily uh, the chief that he had recently met was extremely friendly. Guacanagri um, was was sympathetic, and he ordered his villagers to go out and help Columbus and his men unload their ship, and he welcomed them into their village. Uh, Columbus was honestly super appreciative of their help, and while he was in the village with them, him and Guacanagri really became good friends, like legit friends. Um, Guacanagri told Columbus that there was indeed a, a significant amount of gold further inland and that uh, the ongoing conflicts between his people and the cannibal Carib tribes, she also told him about that. So Columbus and Guacanagri exchanged gifts and Columbus showed him kind of the Spanish weapons, including their cannons. And Guacanagri was blown away by this. He was like, holy crap, these guys have weapons. They, you know, these people kind of thought that Columbus and his men were gods Uh and so when they start doing this stuff with the weapons, he's just blown away. And Columbus tells Guacanagri, like, look, if you have enemies and you want to be our friend and help us, we'll help you fight your enemies. Um, and ultimately what ended up happening is they didn't just have a personal friendship, but they actually kind of created this political alliance between them. And, you know, Guacanagri likely realized that the Spaniards could help him to expand his own power, you know, if he pledged his loyalty, you know, to the Spanish. Um and this was, you know, Guacanagri knew the game. The, the The local tribes in the Americas had been, you know, fighting and conquering one another. And so if you get a chance to have a bigger tribe show up that's a lot stronger in sort of a tri uh, feudal or a tribal society, generally you you basically pledge loyalty to them. You join their team and, you know, to avoid them just taking you over. Um, and so Guacanagri saw the Spaniards as this 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 potential great ally. Now, Despite the great hospitality, Columbus only had one ship, and he knew he had to get back to Spain soon before something happened to that ship, and he had pretty limited room left on his one small remaining ship. The Nina was a very small ship, and so, but he actually didn't have much trouble remedying the issue because Guacanagra and his people were so friendly and so kind, um, and there was, you know, actually now reports of gold nearby a lot of the Spaniards said, we'll stay behind, you know, like leave us behind. We'll, 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 we'll hold down the fort here and you go back to Spain and come back with, with more people. And, and, and then we can figure things out. So Columbus ordered that a fort be made out of the remains of the, the Santa Maria, which had, had, had run aground. And he left about 39 men 
behind, and he gave them explicit orders not to take advantage or to harm the natives. And they they made this little fort, and they called it La Navidad, or the or Christmas, basically, uh, because it was or Fort Christmas, because it was on Christmas that the ship had run aground. Um, so he and the others basically be back in a few months, uh, you know, maybe more than a few months, like five or six months. Uh, with ships and they could do further explanation. They'd bring uh, exploration. They could bring fresh supplies um, and more equipment and stuff to go inland and find the gold. And so as Columbus was preparing to leave, many natives actually even requested to go with Columbus to see the land and cities where, you know, these strange visitors had come from. They were, they were fascinated by it all. And Columbus did end up taking back with him six natives that, that came back with him to Spain. So, <laughs> on about January 6, 1493, he was making his final preparations, okay? And all of a sudden, he gets a report that the Pinta had been spotted further down the coast. Um, Columbus and his crew quickly kind of said their goodbyes. They got their shipmates together. They they jumped on board the ship, and they took off to go catch up with the Pinta. Now, when they catch up to the Pinta, the Pinta's captain, Alonso Pinzon, claimed that he was happy to see Columbus and that there, he couldn't avoid the separation. There was weather problems and Columbus basically knew he was full of crap, um, but he didn't make a big deal of it. He was just happy that he was not going to be making the long crossing back all alone with only one small ship in his fleet. So he was sailing along the northern coast of Haiti and uh, heading back towards Spain and they were heading east, and they entered uh, what is essentially Carib territory. Once you kind of got into the islands in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, they they got into that territory, and they they basically came and had their first kind of hostile encounter with with natives. One day, while they were sailing sailing by a bay, there were a group of natives that they saw, and uh, they, you know they approached them, and as was you know kind of customary, they wanted to trade with them and try and gather information about the region. Uh, but the natives, they just seemed different. They, they, they weren't like the other people that they had encountered. And Columbus starts to get the suspicion that these people are actually Caribs. Uh, they also had bows and other weapons um, with them. And the other natives didn't really seem to be too well armed. And so Columbus, seven men who were on shore kind of were, they were kind of tense. They were, you know, had their hands on their swords. They were interacting with these armed natives, you know, as they were kind of checking their intentions. And, uh, Columbus wanted to see if they could trade with them uh, and wanted to try and get their bows, wanted to trade something to have them give their bows in exchange for these things that the Spaniards were going to give to them. Well, at first the natives were willing and they traded several bows, but upon realizing that the Spanish were basically, they kind of caught on. They're like, oh, wait, these guys are trying to take our weapons. They picked up their weapons quickly. They kind of ran and started grabbing them and something happened. And all of a sudden they were coming against the Spanish and the Spanish, you know, whip out their swords. They apparently stabbed one in the butt and shot one in the in the leg with an arrow or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they wounded a couple of these uh, these warriors and they jumped back in their boats and they got away from the natives and paddled back out to the ship and and, and they were good. Um, however, you know, they, they escaped this little kind of hostile skirmish with the natives, but their luck didn't improve much as they sailed away from the Caribbean and began the crossing over the high seas. Uh, there was a storm that came in and it battered the two small ships. And in the chaos of the storm, Columbus again found himself separated from the Pinta. And when the storm finally cleared, he was all alone again with one ship. So after sailing back for almost a month without any sign of land, um, they, they were, luckily Columbus was an incredible navigator and he was able to spot in the distance, the Azores. Um, and, you know, everyone rejoiced. Um, after a brief run in there with the Portuguese, which we won't go into, um, he made it back to Spain. And uh, actually, the Pinta did end up also making it back about the same time. Um, Columbus was on top of the world. Okay. He, this was, this was all over Spain. Um, everybody in Spain was talking about it. He had gone where no one thought was even possible. And he discovered what believed to be a new trade route to new lands and the riches of Asia. Um, after all these years of selling his crazy idea and everyone kind of, you know, laughing at him for it, he felt like he had been vindicated and all of Spanish upper society began fawning over his tales of adventures and the, the things that he brought back, the parrots, the natives. It was, it, he was like a celebrity. Uh, but after, you know, kind of the show and glamour of his initial return, 
he, he turned his attention to getting back. You know, he had left men behind and uh, he wanted to go back to them and begin setting up a permanent settlement uh, on these new islands uh, and, and get gold coming back in and continue to, you know, explore further to see if he could find, you know, the great con of Asia. So that brings us to uh, the beginning of the second voyage of Christopher Columbus. Um, so it was in about September of 1493, about six months after he'd returned uh, to Spain from his first voyage, that he set sail again. Uh, but this time it was not three ships. It was an entire fleet. He now had 17 ships and 1,200 Spaniards. This consisted of laborers, aristocrats, adventurers, artisans, and the plan was to establish a permanent trading settlement in this new land and extract the gold that uh, that Guacanagri had said was there. Um, and basically, all these people were jumping on board because they were kind of hoping to get their share of these new lands filled with gold, and you know they all they all wanted to be part of this great adventure. Now, Columbus, on the other hand, was still very much dedicated to his vision of discovering the Great Khan, and so. Uh, because he he still kind of wanted to vindicate uh, his theories and uh, establish that trade route and alliances that would allow them to retake Jerusalem and save Christendom. Uh, and in typical feudal fashion, Columbus sailed under the express orders of the crown to acquire new lands for Spain and to make Christian vassals of the peaceful you know, native peoples. Uh, now, as for the cannibals and those who resisted uh, this Spanish takeover— um, they were to be subjected to force uh, or enslaved. And uh, with the goals of the Spanish crown in mind to kind of settle this new territory and his and, and, and claim it for Spain and extract resources from it, and then also with his own personal goals uh, to, to continue on and explore and find the great Khan, um, he set sail with this large number of people and ships uh, with his brother and... Uh, and a recently baptized uh, Taino uh, that he had brought with him, one of the natives, uh, was actually adopted by him as his godson. And uh, he actually was going to go with Columbus back and act as his interpreter and diplomat uh, to the tribes that they encountered. And and Columbus, this this uh, godson Diego, who acted as, as Columbus' interpreter, followed him on multiple voyages. Um, Columbus and him were, you know, as Columbus' godson, he kind of was connected to to Columbus's titles and family in, in a pretty incredible way. So Columbus crossing on his second voyage is, is also considered one of the great historical feats of navigation and seamanship. Um, he had he heard rumors from the natives uh, on this voyage on, or on his first voyage, that there were some islands that were closer to Spain and he didn't know exactly where they were, but he, they had kind of given him a rough idea. Um, and so, with the prospect of a shorter crossing, he intended to try and reach those closer islands that they they had talked about. And incredibly, that's what he did. He sailed a fleet of 17 ships safely and without any kind of serious issues from the Canary Islands across thousands of miles of oceans in an astounding 21 days uh, to the easternmost islands of the Caribbean. It's actually the same route that sailors have basically used ever since. Um, and to this day, a 21-day crossing is an excellent time even for modern sailors with modern equipment. I mean, Columbus was really a uh, an incredible navigator, and his title that he just recently had got, the Admiral of the Ocean Sea, was was, was quite quite fitting. Um, and so, around November of 1493, uh, they sight the islands around Dominica, which are basically the easternmost islands in the Caribbean. And uh, everyone was blown away. I mean, these islands are absolutely gorgeous. They're some of the most beautiful islands uh, in the world. Uh, now, Columbus, when he came upon this area, it also is one of the most desired sailing locations in the world, even to this day. I mean, it's got turquoise water and palm-covered islands and these tall mountains. I mean, it is absolutely stunning, the Eastern Caribbean. And, you know, the weather's pretty steady. The winds are good. And uh, but the, the problem was is that they... These islands of the Eastern Caribbean were inhabited by a very different group of natives than the peaceful and curious Taino people that he'd met on his first voyage. Um, as they began to kind of explore these islands between Dominica and Puerto Rico, um, towards where he had, you know, he's heading back to the men that he left in the first voyage, they were shocked 
uh, by what they found. Uh, there was a doctor on the second voyage who wrote in his journal about the experience, um, and he basically explained that. And, and I have the quote in my in my blog. But essentially, what happened was is that they would, when they go into these villages, they would find women that would come like running to them, and would say like, "Take us away, take us away." And these were Taino women uh, from the peaceful tribes who had been taken by these uh, cannibals. And what they would do is they would hold these women uh, and rape them. Uh, until they would have a baby and then they would uh, basically eat the babies <laughs> or or raise them up. They, they would castrate them and then raise them up and eat them. I mean, he, he reports that there were three boys that they found there and all three of them had been castrated by the cannibals. So, I mean, this, it, it, it's pretty crazy stuff what they found. Um, and so Columbus and his men immediately have a very you know, negative opinion of the, of the Carib, uh, tribes. Uh, so anyway, they come across village after villages. They have some skirmishes with some of them that turn kind of hostile. Um, prisoners end up being taken. Um, however, Columbus worked hard to make peace with any natives that he found. He, he even took a Carib prisoner, uh, tried to give them gifts, clothes, food, and return them back to their people, kind of showing, hey, we're peaceful, like we don't want to fight with you. But, you know, they, they just weren't having it and 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 they were having a lot of trouble and and skirmishes with these natives in the Eastern Caribbean in the fall of 1493. Another shocking kind of tale from this part of his voyage was they actually found a, a baby that had been abandoned um when they came into one of those villages and they, they believed it was you know, baby that was basically being held for food. And so they, they, they took it on board and did their best to care for it. The baby didn't end up surviving, but, but, uh, it, it does show that Columbus was basically going to these villages, finding these people that had been abused and taken by the, by the Caribs and was doing his best to, to free them and help them. Um, now there was one very sad and, and atrocious episode during this portion of his voyage that happened to, you know, after one of the, one of these skirmishes. So after one of these skirmishes with the natives, the Spanish took a prisoner and they take prisoner, both men and women from these tribes. And, uh, one of the women was placed under the charge of one of Columbus's close associates, a guy named Michelle de Cuneo. Um, now there is a letter, uh, which is alleged to be written by Cuneo, which was discovered in the 1880s. And uh, it basically describes how he raped one of these women. Um, it, it, but some people make a lot out of this. However, the historical record in no way concludes that Columbus knew about this act of barbarism. And considering that he had actually uh, told his men not to take women by force just in his previous voyage and was continually telling people to treat them fairly, I, I can't imagine uh, based on the, the, that he knew what was going on. Okay, there's no there's no indication to that, despite what what some people want to try and claim about it. Um, in fact, there's a good case to be made that the reason that uh, this woman was placed under the 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 care of or custody of Michelle Cuneo was because Columbus knew him and trusted him and thought that he wouldn't do these kinds of things. So there's uh, people will try and read into that. The historical record though does not indicate that Columbus uh, knew what his uh, friend uh, had done. And that is if the letter is authentic, which there is some dispute over. Anyway, so they go through the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, they're heading back, trying to get back to the guys that are left behind. And uh, anyway, they begin to approach uh, the area they called La Navidad, where this little fort was. And he's kind of like, all right, getting back to his men. Um, but, you know, they've been there for eight months by this point. But their excitement... Uh, and getting back to these men really kind of turned to horror when they came upon a dead body near one of the rivers along the shore. They could see that the dead body was that of a man with a full beard, and they knew that the natives didn't really grow facial hair, and so they all kind of fe feared the worst. And when they finally pulled into the bay where Columbus had left uh, those 39 men eight months before, they were horrified to find that all that remained was charred wood of the fort mixed with human bodies. All 39 of them, including some of them that were related to Columbus, were dead. Um, the Spanish were struck with both grief and outrage. You can only imagine, you know, Columbus is now sitting there and he's surrounded by 1,200 Spaniards who are pissed off and looking for ju justice. Luckily, Columbus didn't lose his composure and he immediately sent for his native friend uh, from the last voyage, the chief Guacanagri. And he came to Columbus and he told him that he had done all he could to protect his men and that he was even wounded trying to save, 
to you know to save them. Um, Guacanagrian said that the Spaniards that Columbus had left behind had gone inland looking for gold, and they began to make off with local women from a rival tribe. Uh, the chief of that tribe, who was a warlike uh, chief named Kaunabo, declared war on the foreigners. And despite Guacanagri's best efforts to defend them, the entire crew were killed when Kaunabo and his warriors showed up and uh, and took them all out. Now, needless to say, these 1,200 Spaniards that are there with Columbus are pissed. They're outraged. They had just spent the last month dealing with almost nothing but hostile natives and now found out that all of their countrymen that had been left behind on the first voyage had been killed. And a lot of them doubted Guacanagri's story. Uh, and especially uh, they doubted it when it was apparent that the wound um, <laughs> that uh, Guacanagri claimed to have suffered, they, they, they ended up figuring out that it was a fake wound. He, he wasn't really hurt. Um, and despite all this, you know, Columbus believed Guacanagri. Um, and he wanted to defuse the tension. So what he did is he basically said, look, we're just going to go and find a new place to settle that isn't so close to, to Guacanagri's village because he didn't want to, you know, cause any problems there. And so Columbus and his fleet sails on uh, along the northern coast of Haiti for about 50 miles uh, from where Guacanagri was uh, to a large bay. And the 17 ships unload all 1,200 settlers and the adventures and they beat and adventurers, and they begin to construct a town that Columbus names La Isabella, after the Queen of Spain. Um, and almost immediately, Columbus runs into all sorts of headaches. Um, first of all, one of the big ones was that the working class on the voyage, they were willing to get their hands dirty and work. Now, they were in there getting in and building the town. But the Spanish aristocrats, which are known as Hidalgos, felt, you know, this kind of labor is beneath us, and they didn't you know, they, they, they were sitting there looking at the natives going, why don't we get natives to do this work for us? And, and Columbus was super annoyed by this. He's like, these guys are lazy. They won't do any work themselves. They thought they'd just come here and get a bunch of money and easy riches. And, and anyway, he was pissed off at them. And then sickness breaks out. Now, all these people are coming to a new land with new illnesses. And obviously, the natives got the way worse of that. Um, but they also got sick. And within about a month, it was reported that almost a third of the settlers were so sick that they couldn't work. Um, still throughout that fall, um, and winter, the, the town kind of began to, began to take shape. Uh, and so during this kind of warm winter of where they're building the settlement, Columbus decides that, you know, he wants to find out where this gold is that Guacanagri had been talking about. And so he appoints this ambitious young 28 year old officer named Alonso de Ojeda. And, uh, his thing was, Hey, take a scouting party and go inland and look for this gold. And seek where, you know, we might be able to establish a mining operation. Well, Ojeda and his group push into the interior of the island. Uh, and they come into this large valley um, with mountains on either side of it. And uh, anyway, he was working with the natives there to try and find out where this gold was. And the natives refer to this region as the Cibao, um, which is this large valley in the northern part of the modern Dominican Republic. And uh, he ends up finding gold. And he returns to Columbus. He's all excited. He's like, hey, there's gold in there. We just got to go inland about, you know, I think it was like 15 miles or 20 miles or something. And Columbus is super excited about these reports. And, you know, he thinks, all right, good. Now we're going to get the money for the king and queen and it'll validate their investments in us right on. Um, he was also dealing with some illness and a bunch of disgruntled settlers uh, that didn't want to work. <laughs> And, uh, in fact, many of the Hidalgos, these aristocrats wouldn't even eat local food, which was super abundant. Um, and they began to claim that they were starving because, you know, the Spanish food that they had brought began to, to run low. And so in February, Columbus decides to send back 12 of his 17 ships along with a letter to the king and queen requesting more supplies. Um, and he also sends back caribs that they had captured, um, that they had, you know, had made slaves of, um, and, you know, Columbus naively hoped that these natives could be brought out of their ways by sending them back to Spain and teaching them Christianity. Um, now, Christians could not be slaves under Spanish law. So Columbus, you know, he wanted to see them freed and integrated and reformed. And, you know, he had captured these people who were hostile and, and cannibals. And uh, he thought that through baptism, they could be freed uh, of their ways and then become interpreters and guides for future endeavors. And so he has kind of this naive idealistic vision of, 
you know, what he can do. And so he sends these, these people back to uh, Spain as slaves so that they could be reformed. Now, when the ships arrive in Spain, about half of these natives are dead from the illnesses. They didn't have any immunity to these. And that was a constant problem. Anytime that they had consistent close contact with Spaniards, they would get illnesses and they would die. Um, and, you know, other problem was when these ships arrived with these, you know, dead natives, <laughs> they also, the ones that were going back to Spain were the ones who most disliked Columbus and were unhappy. And so the king and queen start to get word of like, hey, things aren't going so great over there. And they're kind of like, hmm, that's kind of weird. But they they send back the supplies anyway. So at this point, uh, Columbus decides he's going to start heading inland. Uh, and so he decides to make a full-blown expedition to this Cibao region where there is uh, gold and and where they can establish mining operations. And so he puts together his army with all this pomp and circumstance and and they, they make all this, you know, all this noise and drums and everything. And they kind of march out to kind of deter both to go there, but also to kind of show the natives like, hey, don't mess with us. And they get to the Cibao region and he's enthralled by its beauty and its fertility, and he, they find signs of gold there. So he leaves 50 men behind under the command of a, an officer named Pedro de Marguerite. And he was given the orders to build a fort, which they would call uh, Fort St. Thomas, after kind of doubting Thomas because people doubted that they could find gold there. Anyway, kind of had some fun with the names. Um, now, after this nearly month-long expedition of going in and beginning to get the 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 fort set up. Columbus returns to Isabella, which is on the coast, and he finds a mess. Sickness is still ravaging the town and about 60% of the town burned up in a fire. And uh, so he's just like, oh my gosh, what a mess. And he didn't even get three days to deal with those problems when all of a sudden a messenger arrived from Fort St. Thomas and it's 50 men who are inland saying that they were being attacked by Count Nabo, the same chief who had killed uh, the men that were left behind on the first voyage. So Columbus immediately decides, let's go get this guy. This is the guy who killed our people. He's now trying to attack us here. Let's go get him. So he uh, gets about 400 of his most battle ready men, kind of his hardest men. And he puts them under the command of, of that guy, Ojeda, that young officer. And uh, he says, look, go in there and take out the native threat. And then when you get there, you take over at the fort. Uh, once you kind of quelled any natives that are fighting back against us and uh and then give margaret uh marguerite the 400 soldiers and let him go and continue to explore inland and see what he can find and this is a decision that columbus will come to bitterly regret because of what margaret does with those 400 men so columbus he kind of seemed to be naive about spanish conquistador culture uh as soon as he sends out ojeda with these 400 soldiers some of ojeda's men uh, have their clothes stolen by natives. And in a disgusting overreaction and filled with his zealous bravado, uh, Ojeda finds the local chief who actually had the clothes and he demands them back. And the chief is kind of like, no, these are our clothes. Um, and so Ojeda sees the chief, his entire household, and he cuts off one of the chief's uh, men's ears. So uh, he knows he means business. And so the chief uh, ends up being sent back to Columbus in chains now columbus was likely shocked by this you know um but he also was under pressure from all the spaniards who wanted to see some you know wanted to let the natives know not to mess with them they just had killed some of their men and anyway so there and so columbus is kind of caught between a rock and a hard place so he decides i'm going to order them executed kind of putting on this brave show um but it, it honestly it seems to me i think when you look at the source that this was a, a strategic bluff because that was kind of there to placate the Spaniards. Because as soon as the local chief just pleaded for their lives and begged forgiveness, Columbus let them all go free and basically just said, Hey, just don't steal again. You know? So while, you know, people were kind of like, Oh, he sentenced them to death. He didn't actually go through with it. And it looks like it was kind of a hollow threat to placate the Spaniards and also kind of let them know like, all right, well don't ever do that again. Or next time, you know, we're not messing around here. Anyway, so in late April, Ojeda has been sent out to continue his march to quell any natives that are fighting against the fort inland. And Columbus is, he's disillusioned by this point. 
he has all these headaches of settlement management and he, he's like, you know, what? let me put some other guys in, cha- in charge of the settlement. I'm going to go move and see if I can find the great con. He wanted to find Asia. He didn't want to sit around and tinker with these gold operations. He wanted to, to continue to explore. So he put his brother Diego and some others in charge of the settlement and he prepared his ships for, uh, you know, an expedition within an expedition. Um, he wanted to push west along Cuba as far as he could to see if the island was a peninsula uh, or the Asian mainland. Um, so he began this six-month voyage um, on April 24th of 1494, and he headed down the uh, southern coast of Cuba. And he was pushing along the southern coast, and uh, he found some of the uh, you know natives that he previously had found, and they were friendly and 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 during one of these encounters with some of the natives on Cuba, they had mentioned a large island to the south. And so Columbus set sail in that direction, and he actually discovered Jamaica. Um, and he was enchanted by its beauty, and but he didn't really find any significant signs of gold. So he kind of sailed along the coast for a while, but then he was like, you know what, this this place doesn't have gold. It's not the Great Con, so I want to continue with my mission. So he goes back up, sails back up to Cuba, and then he continues to push west into these you know unexplored waters. But um, the weather begins to get really bad. So summer is the rainy season in the Caribbean, and it's hot and muggy, and there are all sorts of storms or actually hurricanes that happen that time of year. Um, But it just gets really crappy for them. Um, Also, they find themselves in kind of this maze of small islands and reefs um, that made the sailing really dangerous and, and difficult. Columbus actually ran aground several times on uh, on this uh, voyage, but he was able to get unstuck due to some sailing tricks he knew, and and uh, you know, they, but but it was really stressful. You know, they had shallow reefs, they had bad weather, humidity, and his health really began to suffer. He began to have terrible eye pains, fevers. He was unable to sleep. Um, he also found very few natives on this land. It seemed to be a lot more desolate as they continued sailing, um, not like the northern coast of Cuba. And uh, it, it just didn't seem as good as they as they pressed on. Eventually, they, they did find some, some natives, uh, even though they were pretty rare. And one of those natives told him that Cuba was actually an island. And that was not what Columbus wanted to hear, because <laughs> he was trying to find the Asian mainland. Uh, but he kind of remained skeptical, but eventually he, he felt like he couldn't push on any further. Um, he had almost reached the far western tip of Cuba, but the sailing was just so miserable and the supplies were so low. Many of the men were sick, including Columbus, and it was decided we need to turn back. This is getting out of hand. So the return trip that they made was against the wind and it was no relief. They pressed on day after day against rain, wind, rough seas. Columbus nearly died um, on that return voyage, uh, but he did arrive with his haggard crew in the settlement uh, back at Isabella in September of uh, 1494 after spending six months at sea um and when he got back he was he was pretty quick to find that his his luck was not about to improve we'll continue with our second half of the columbus story in our next episode so do you enjoy the content here on thoughtful faith if so be sure to hit the notification bell this ensures that our new videos show up on your feed Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.